Today, folks visit Southern University in Baton Rouge. Dr. Joffrey Wissington will tell us how proposed budget cuts will affect the Southern University system, and some students will share with us their thoughts about proposed tuition hikes. We'll also introduce you to Brigadier General Sherian Kadoria, a 1961 Southern graduate. I'm Robin Hinton. A look at Southern University Baton Rouge today on Folks. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Folks. Located on Scotts Bluff along the Mississippi River is the main campus of Southern University, the focus of our program today. Now, the university's roots go back to 1880. You see, that's the year in which Southern University was founded in New Orleans. But in 1914, the university moved upriver from the Crescent City to Baton Rouge. The first president at the Baton Rouge location was Dr. Joseph S. Clark. He was succeeded by his son, Dr. Felton Clark, both are buried on Southern's campus. From 1968 through 1974, the university was run by a Dr. Leon Netterville. He was succeeded by Dr. Jesse Stone, who resigned last year. The current president is Dr. Joffrey Wissington, who has the task of guiding the university through the struggles of today, the biggest one being money. Here is an excerpt from an interview we did with Dr. Wissington in the fall of 1985. And how would you describe the quality of education at Southern University? The quality of education uh, is outstanding, and this is why we have the theme moving from excellence to one of preeminence. Uh, we have a number of our programs accredited by specialized accrediting agencies. In essence, this adds a lot of credibility. It puts the icing on the cake. There are about, cake. There are about eight programs accredited by specialized agencies, and we want all of our programs accredited. Uh, that is a rather ambitious goal because it is going to take additional revenues. But to do that, I think we will be able to get the additional support of our alumni and also the local community in terms of raising funds to bring about uh, the accreditation of these specialized programs. You were recently successful in getting raises for some faculty members. How will this enhance the uh, quality of education at Southern? Well, greatly, and I really don't want to take the credit for that. Uh, that was uh, done by the Board of Supervisors, uh, well, our Board of Supervisors following a, a faculty study. Uh, under the leadership of Dr. Jesse Stone, and of course I'm trying to build on the foundation that was established by Dr. Stone, as well as the other presidents of the university. And I have simply had the opportunity to implement those raises. You want to increase student enrollment. How do you plan to do this? We are really improving our programs. This year we added a doctoral program in the area of special education. Uh, you can really call us a comprehensive university. We're multi-purpose. Uh, we offer a number of programs, and of course, I think to have the doctoral program, um, that is one thing that will certainly entice a number of students to enroll in the university. Now, next year, we will also have the PhD program in accountancy. So we have programs across the board, and we can meet the needs of all students who enroll. Are efforts by other universities throughout the state, let's say like LSU, and their efforts to recruit minority students, are, is that going to hurt your efforts to in increase your student enrollment? I would think not. Uh, first of all, I think that all of our institutions, as we work with them to improve opportunity and access uh, for our students, we like all students, whether they are minority students or non-minority students, to attend college. But we would like for those students to come to Southern University. Uh, those students also will benefit from our dual degree program that we have in a number of areas uh, between Southern University and Louisiana State University. We also have programs with Southeastern Louisiana University. So. We're working together, taking advantage of our academic common marketplace that will make it better for all students who attend Southern University. 
What about non-minority students to comply with the state consent decree? Uh, where does it stand now, and how do you plan to increase non-minority student enrollment? Well, I think that uh, we have just about reached the goal that was established some time ago. Uh, across the board, we have about 6% of our student body uh, with non-minority students, and we're working to increase that. One of the things that we were able to do this year under the consent decree, we were able to employ a, a non-minority recruiter. In other words, a majority recruiter for white students. That, that sounds rather strange on a black campus. Uh, but we do have an individual uh, who will focus uh, his time mainly on recruiting uh, white students. What are some of the things that you're telling white students in order to entice them to Southern University? Well, we're telling them the same thing we would tell any student. I think because of the fact that uh, there are certain myths about certain institutions, uh, people have negative feelings. And uh, I think that once an individual visit our campus, uh, to look at the number of students we have outside of the state, uh, to look at the diversity, to look at the very strong faculty that we have, then of course that student would be made to feel at home. But we have every program that any student would desire to uh, enroll in at the university, whether it's in engineering, architecture, in the sciences, in the humanities, in the arts, uh, you name it and we have it. Money Wolves, the Commissioner of Administration has ordered all state agency to draft their 1986-87 budgets at 78% of what is believed it will cost to continue at this year's level of services. That's a 22% cut. What will that mean as far as Southern University is concerned? It will have a definite negative impact of, upon our programs across the board. And we would hope that we are able to find additional, find additional revenue so that, that that will not happen. Uh, if it does, it means that we'll have to have drastic cutbacks and uh, it will affect all of the institutions in the state not only Southern University. But hopefully that will not happen. Do you, if it does happen, do you foresee layoffs as, as part of that? If it happens, uh, we will have to go into a period of retrenchment. As a matter of fact, we're in a period of fiscal austerity at this point. Uh, we're still trying to overcome the 3% cut. And another cut uh, has been proposed following uh, the Christmas holidays. So to get into next year with a 22% cut, that would really be devastating. Now, that was Dr. Whistington from an earlier broadcast. Today, Dr. Whistington is saying that if budget cuts are imposed, the dream of access to higher education for many minority students will be just that, a dream. How will proposed budget cuts affect students at Southern University? Well, we spoke to some undergraduates, and here's what they had to say. You know, it, it will have a devastating impact. I think that by, you know, with the cutbacks in financial aid, right away you're going to eliminate some people, you know, of affording them the opportunity to go to school because of, you know, simple money. They don't have enough money to pay for the, uh, the costs. And uh, as you said, there is little doubt. So I, I think it's beginning to take its toll on people, you know, mentally. They're beginning to think about it. And it'll make some of us come to some decisions about, you know, school. It'll affect me a great deal because uh, really I do not receive too much financial aid here. And uh, I'm not an on-campus student. I have a lot of other bills besides school bills to pay. So I think it really would affect me and I, I have a little more time before I graduate from here. I feel that it's going to be hard because a lot of students here at Southern University rely on the financial aid and the other aids to um, come to school and with the cutbacks it's going to be hard for a lot of the families to send their um, children to college. I'm already paying out of state fees and um, if that goes up I'm going to be forced to go back home which is California because I can't pay that much money. I don't have that much. I'm not working and you know my mother's not doing too well right now. I'll have to go back home and work and try to save some money to go further my tuition in school. To, to be very honest I think the cutbacks and the limitation in aid will affect, affect some students who attend Southern University as well as other uh, public institutions. I think that it is, it is no secret at this particular point that aid as well as finances are very hard for students to, to acquire and, and to, to, come, to come by in order to, to attain the education that they hope to or want to continue here at this institution. So I think we will see an effect uh, by all means and that's why we're, we're moving in terms of to talk with legislators in, in, in terms of not to and to stop the cutbacks at this point. How does it make you feel when you hear the administrators and legislators discussing the budget cuts? Well, living in Louisiana, with Louisiana being at the bottom of the list of education, 
I find it very somewhat uh, uh, surprising and shocking that for all the areas in which you want to cut, you would cut back in education. I think we should be propelling, and edu education should be a very high, the high, uh, top priority here in the state of Louisiana. So I find it very shocking and disturbing. Upset because, like I said, there are a lot of black students, there are a lot of students, period, who want to come to college, and because of the financial situation, um, many are not able to. And with the cutbacks, that's probably going to um, keep a lot more students from being able to attend college. It makes me feel real bad because I want to stay here and go to school, you know, but I'm going to be forced to go back home. I wanted to go out. My life was plan was to always to go to Southern University and graduate because everybody have graduated, all my relatives. And if this happens, I'm going to have to go back home. I feel a little relieved simply because I'm a senior. And then again, I, as I think about it, I, 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 you know, I feel a little hurt because I can look at it in terms of the, the long range effect. You know, the, the number of students you know across the country that were that won't be you know able to afford college and I think that's a that's a heartbreaking heartbreaking factor how would you rate the education that you've gotten here at Southern how would I rate it I think it's a well first of all Southern University offers a good education I think they offer a good quality education program I think it's up to the individual himself to uh, you know make it make the most out of it and uh, I have done that to the best of my ability so I would rate it uh, as a very very good education and a good quality experience I feel it's great I feel education here in Southern is it's pretty good really it's what you what you make of it um, it's, it's fine well to me the education is real good you know the teachers want to help you and you know they try so hard to get to us you know me, I'm kind of quiet and everything takes a lot, but I think the education is really good. You know, teachers really try to get to their students and that's what you need to do. I believe that it is a top quality of doing the best that you can with what you have. And I believe that Southern has committed itself to that and will continue to commit to the, top, to the type of excellence and, and moving toward preeminence to provide the education for students with the limited kind of support and resources that we have. But we are continuing to move forward and that's why we're asking and we cannot stand or, or even put up with a, a budget cut of the magnitude that we're discussing here today. Each spring, the university commemorates its founding with a morning convocation, and this year was no different. It took place here at the Felton Clark Activity Center, and the keynote speaker was Brigadier General Sherry and Kadoria, a 1961 Southern graduate. At Jackie Robinson's funeral, the Reverend Jesse Jackson stated, and I quote, This man turned a stumbling block into a stepping stone. And that is what each of us must do, turn stumbling blocks into stepping stones as we climb the ladder of success. And because we can turn stumbling blocks into stepping stones, there is no reason that we cannot be optimistic about tomorrow, about the next decade and beyond. Shirley Chisholm said, and I quote, we can tell a great deal about where this country is going by taking a good look at where it has been politically, economically, and morally. Just as we can make certain predictions about the actions of individuals based upon their past experiences and values, we can best grapple with the problems which will beset us in the next decade and beyond when we come to understand the heritage which has made us the kind of people, the kind of nation we are today." End quote. And we have a proud heritage, one of drive, push, staying power, and courage. These are the historical strengths from which all of us must step forward, from which we must say, don't move the ladder because we are going to climb it. Thus, we can then move from excellence to preeminence. Some people may say that the greatest challenge facing us today is the threat of nuclear war or the spread of communism. And I say that is not true. The greatest challenge facing us today is the struggle here 
and in every county, parish, and city throughout the United States to assure that all citizens, regardless of race, ethnic origin, or sex, are not denied their human rights and are allowed to achieve their educational and occupational potential. Dr. Martin Luther King's dream for a better world, a better America, where all people have the opportunity for self-actualization, still lives. And he is but one of many who said, don't move the ladder. I am going to climb it. And through excellence in education and other endeavors, rose to preeminence and provided us a blueprint for doing the same. We are the inheritors of his legacy. Using that legacy, you and I can also climb the ladder of success and use our educational prowess to become preeminent. To those who are willing to say, don't move the ladder, I'm going to climb it, recognize that it is going to be difficult. It will require a total personal commitment. It requires perseverance and tenacity of purpose. Atlas Huxley, an English author, stated, and I quote, perhaps the most valuable result of all education is the ability to make yourself do the things you have to do when it ought to be done, whether you like it or not. And it is the first lesson that ought to be learned. And however early a man's training begins, it is probably the last lesson that he learns thoroughly." End quote. Major General Harry Brooks, one of our retired black general officers, once said to me, now, Sherry, to be a success, to be a winner, there are three things that you need. First, you must be willing to pay the price to get the job done, to grow personally to handle the job. Take courses, read books, and talk to others with the goals the ultimate goals of personal and professional growth. Secondly, be willing to make a personal commitment. When given a job, you can be counted on, depended upon. And most importantly, when given a job to do, then everyone will consider that job done. And thirdly, be willing to take personal responsibility for your own life and own actions. Realize that ultimately you are responsible for everything that happens to you. I can assure you that was very good advice, which I have followed throughout my 24 and a half year career. And if you will follow it, I am sure that you will find it to be very good advice also. There may come a time when we may for a moment go off course in our quest for excellence. If this happens, remember the words of Sophocles, and I quote, the ideal condition would be, I admit, that men be right by instinct. But since we are likely to go astray, the reasonable thing is to learn from those who can teach, end quote. Keep in mind that we can learn not only in our formal institutions such as Southern University, but we can learn from others such as the old Irishman who once advised his son, it takes three bones for success, the wishbone, the jawbone, and the backbone. The wishbone keeps us wanting the good things in life. The jawbone will help us to find out how to get them if we're not too proud to ask questions. And the old backbone will keep us after them in spite of discouragements until we get them. Now the person who wishes to climb the ladder of success will apply the three bones to anything he or she decides to undertake, especially that old backbone. For anything that is worth doing or achieving, 
will take hard work and above all determination to keep on when feeling totally, absolutely discouraged. In observing successful men and women, I have noted they have perseverance and they knew how to use time. This is highlighted in the following, which I'm sure you're going to recognize. Today is the first day of the rest of my life. This is the beginning of a new day. I have been given this day to use as I may choose. It can be wasted or it may be used for good. But what is done today is important because I am exchanging a day of my life for it. And we should all keep in mind that when tomorrow comes, this day will be gone forever, leaving in its place something that we have traded for it. We must want it to be a gain and not a loss, success and not failure in order that we shall not regret the price that has been paid for it. And some of us do pay a very, very heavy price. One of the spring attractions on the Baton Rouge campus is the Tourget de Beauce Piano Competition. This year marks the 12th year of the piano competition, and it takes place April 24 through 26 here at the University Music Building. Tourget de Beauce graduated from Fisk University with music honors. He studied piano at Oberlin Conservatory and the Juilliard School of Music. He held numerous teaching positions, though most of his teaching years were spent at Southern. Myrtle David is director of the Tourget de Beauce competition, and she gave us a brief history lesson on how the competition came to be. Well, the history is vivid, we like to think, but it's very brief. We have a tendency to think of our competition as being in existence a long time, but when you think about the competitions of the United States that are considered national or international, we're just a, still a babe in the woods. We're, we'll be celebrating our 12th year, this 1986 in April. So we're very pleased at the progress that we have made in this very short time period. We started out with as few as about 20 contestants our first year, which is a very small amount, and we've grown considerably since that time. Students who participate in the competition come from all over the country, and as we have seen in past competitions, they are also very proficient when it comes to tickling the ivories.
So what are some of the highlights of this year's competition? Well, 1986 will feature our first year offering the concerto competition. And the concerto competition is our added treat for this year, and we hope it will be an integral part from now on. It offers students who are interested in performance with the concert orchestra an opportunity to try their wings before they are truly ready for this professional responsibility. It's kind of a paraprofessional experience. And this kind of experience will also ultimately lead us into competition that will involve duo and duet piano works as well. So this is our latest edition, and we are looking very much so for the kinds of contestants that we hope that this will attract. Then, in addition, we maintain our college competition, which involves the junior and senior students competing against each other, which is quite a job, because if you're a junior and you're a senior, you automatically are on a different level. But it pulls everybody forward. The freshman and sophomore college students compete against each other. And that is a continuum thing. We have also made an effort to include the maturity by having a young artist level. We have had some exceptionally talented young people to come from great distances and compete at a very extraordinary level, uh, say at age 16 and age 15, and then go on to, say, the Van Cliven competition later on, which is an international level competition. Our artist for 1986 is John Young, who happens to be a native of Alabama, but is professionally working in the area of Baltimore, Maryland, and the Washington, D.C. Atlantic Seaboard. And he's done amazing things with his career as have many of the others that we have had. We've had some very seasoned artists, such as Natalie Hunderas, one of the premier artists uh, in the business of piano performance, classical piano performance. And we have had some very new concert pianists. But John Young is new to the South, comparatively speaking. And this is one of the new things, and not so terribly new, interesting things we find about presenting a, a nationally recognized personality. Because without this involvement at Southern University as the university headquarters uh, with the competition, many of these artists would not have uh, this particular tour area in their entourage of areas to visit. Well, that's our program for today. Thanks for watching. Next week, folks, visit Xavier University in New Orleans. Be sure to check it out. Until that time, make it a good week. Bye-bye. Folks is celebrating its fifth year on LPB. And to celebrate the occasion, we have had designed a five-year commemorative poster. Now, if you are interested in having one, write us and let us know. Send your inquiry to folks in care of Louisiana Public Broadcasting, 7860 and Selmo Lane, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70810. We'll be sure to get one off to you right away.